All right, so we are going to go into our next unit. It is the autonomic nervous system, something that we have kind of sort of talked about a little bit, right? You at least know that I told you the autonomic nervous system is the automatic nervous system, right? Y'all remember that? Thank you. Okay. So, um, in order to learn this autonomic nervous system, we're going to compare it to the stuff we already know, which is the somatic nervous system. And I just want to take a minute here to go over this before we start so we don't get confused. So the somatic nervous system is what we talked about the entire last unit, okay? Somatic nervous system was the one that had the central nervous system, which was the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, peripheral, right? Which had your cranial nerves and your spinal nerves. Y'all remember that stuff? Cool. So now we're comparing that somatic nervous system to the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so. That somatic nervous system, the one we talked about, that's the one that you had your sensory neurons bringing in sensations of touch, pain, temperature, whatever, to the spinal cord or up to the brain and then relaying it to a motor neuron, which will then leave that central nervous system, go to the muscle and cause its contraction, right? Okay. Um, the autonomic nervous system runs alongside that somatic nervous system. It's going to have sensory receptors also, but they're going to be a little bit different. They're gonna be um, receptors that are embedded inside of our organs. They're going to pick up on things that we're not conscious of. Things like your blood pressure, your um, carbon dioxide levels, your stomach distension. These are interoceptors that are embedded in the walls of our organs and our vessels to measure all of our internal um, environment. And they're going to take that sensory to the central nervous system and come back with a motor neuron also that's going to control things um, like how fast we're breathing, how fast our heart is beating, whether we're um, producing hormones or not, whether our stomach is turning or not, okay? All right. This is what, so we're letting go of the sensory part now. We're looking at only that motor neuron that's coming off of the spinal cord or central nervous system and going to its effector. When we are talking about the somatic nervous system, the one we've already done, one of the main differences is that in that somatic nervous system, you had one motor neuron one motor neuron that left your spinal cord and then went to that muscle, caused it to contract, okay? It was always just one. That means that if I'm talking about the neuron that innervates or moves the muscle from my big toe and it started at S2, it's gonna go all the way from up here all the way down, that is one neuron, okay? That's the somatic nervous system. When we are talking about, oh, one other thing about the somatic nervous system is that this motor neuron right here can only cause that skeletal muscle to contract. It's something we didn't really focus on, but I want to mention it now. So it only gives it an excitation. It only contracts the muscle, okay? It doesn't inhibit the muscle. It doesn't do anything else. It just makes it contract. Once that signal is no longer being transmitted, the neurotransmitter has been removed from that synaptic cleft, that muscle relaxes. Okay, when we are talking about the autonomic nervous system, that motor neuron is actually two motor neurons. Okay, so if I were to draw that same picture, but now I'm talking about the autonomic nervous system, there's my spinal cord, there's my evil gray butterfly, here's my motor neuron, let me put it in a different color, Here's my motor neuron leaving the spinal cord. Okay, this is an autonomic motor neuron. There's my first one. And then it's gonna connect with another motor neuron. And that second motor neuron is the one that will go to the effector organ. I'm just gonna draw a little stomach right there. So, okay, 
I've got two motor neurons involved with the autonomic nervous system most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, because there is an exception that we'll talk about. That first motor neuron, this one right here, is the preganglionic neuron. Why, where did I get that name from? Right here, where this synapse happens, remember, you've got the axon, or the axon terminal of the first neuron meeting the cell body of the second neuron. We don't put cell bodies of neurons just anywhere in the body. Just like your sensory neurons, remember, they like to hang out in the ganglion. All of our cell bodies will hang out in a ganglion. So that yellow circle that I just made, that is an autonomic ganglion, okay? This is a ganglion. That's where the cell bodies of that second neuron is going to be, and that's where the two are going to meet. So, right, right, most of the time, yes. So, neuron number one, this is number one right here, that is my pre, preganglionic, because it's before the ganglion. Neuron number two is my post post-ganglionic neuron because it's behind the ganglion, okay? So that means that if I am following nerve conduction or impulse coming from the central nervous system as part of the autonomic nervous system, it's going to be on this motor neuron here. This is the pre-ganglionic neuron. It's going to go to an autonomic ganglia where it will transmit that impulse to the postganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron is going to take that impulse to my effector organ and cause its effect. Okay? Cool? Make sense? Awesome. So, one of the main differences is your somatic system only has one motor neuron. That's what we've already done and know. When we talk about autonomic, most of the time I've got two motor neurons, a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. And then, of course, there's that autonomic ganglia that connects the two, or harbors the cell bodies. Okay? Let's go on to this. This is what it looks like when it's drawn out. So, don't freak out about this picture just yet, okay? Because we're going to, because I can feel your energy. I swear, I can feel it. <laughs> we're going to come back to this several times. I promise by the end we'll have it down. Okay, looking at the top here, this is what we were just talking about. Here's your spinal cord. There is, in blue, your preganglionic neuron. It is going to come to an autonomic ganglia where it synapses on your postganglionic neuron. Your postganglionic neuron goes to your organs, releases the neurotransmitter there, causes its effect, okay? I told you that most of the time, that's how it happens with two neurons. And up here, it's just showing you a sympathetic. Down here, it's showing you parasympathetic. You'll understand the difference later on today. Right here in the middle, this is that option where it doesn't involve the two neurons. Because what can happen is that preganglionic neuron leaving the spinal cord instead of synapsing in a ganglion can actually go to the adrenal gland. More specifically, it goes to the middle of this gland, the adrenal medulla. The adrenal gland sits right on top of your kidneys. It goes to the adrenal medulla, and there are cells inside of that adrenal medulla called chromaffin cells. And those chromaffin cells will be the ones that release the neurotransmitter. So there's only one neuron involved in this instance, okay? The preganglionic neuron goes to the adrenal medulla, relays that impulse onto the chromaffin cells. Chromaffin cells will release a neurotransmitter that then goes into the bloodstream and causes that effect that way. Cool? Okay. Oops, sorry. I want to change this color. I think purple's reminding me of jelly beans that I don't like. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. So now we understand where the sensory comes from in our autonomic nervous system. We know that there are receptors embedded in our internal organs and vessels that give feedback of what's happening. They take it to the central nervous system. The central nervous system sends out two motor neurons, a preganglionic 
and a postganglionic, which will end on the effector organ. Let's talk about um, the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, because there are two parts to this nervous system, or two main parts. The first one is the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, I'm sure we've all heard this somewhere, maybe sometime, like you've at least heard fight or flight, right? Okay. So unlike the somatic nervous system where they can only, those neurons, motor neurons can only excite, the autonomic nervous system has two divisions to it and they do the opposite of each other, okay? Now, the sympathetic nervous, sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is my fight or flight. What does that mean? It means that this is the division that kicks into gear when I need heightened senses, when I need a lot of focus, when I need to exert myself physically. Whenever you need to give it a little bit more, that sympathetic system is what kicks in. They call it fight or flight because this is the one where if at night I'm walking, leaving campus, going out to the parking lot, and I hear footsteps behind me, and all of a sudden I'm a little worried, that's the one that starts, okay, there's some danger, something's going on, your heart rate elevates, your blood pressure elevates, your muscles get increased blood flow, getting ready for me to fight for my life, right, or run, yeah. That's also the system that you hear like stories where, you know, a mother um, saved her child by, you know, throwing a car out of the way or just like these bionic insane things that you hear. Come on, I'm sure there's something like that. If I search the internet, I could find it, I bet. No, I did not know that. Like training. I didn't know that. Wow, that's super cool. Yeah, <laughs> that is actually really cool. But yeah, so the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight division, meaning once it is stimulated, it has the ability to do things like increase your alertness, um, increase your metabolism, increase blood flow to your muscles, heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen to your brain. It throws everything into high gear so you're prepped to do whatever this is that you have to do, whether it's fighting or, or running, right? Um, your parasympathetic nervous system or division is actually sort of the opposite. So the parasympathetic is the one that is your rest and digest. That is our Netflix and chill division. That's the, you know, we're sitting around on the couch eating chips and just chilling out. It slows everything down. It can slow your breathing rate. It can slow your heart rate. It can uh, lower your blood pressure. It does help you digest food, so it increases blood flow to your um, GIT. This is the reason they told you when you were a kid, don't eat and then get in the pool, right? Because getting in the pool is a physical activity that requires you to be able to you know, swim and exert yourself, and that would be part of sympathetic. But when you're eating, that's when your parasympathetic kicks in to help you digest everything and, and kind of shuts all the other stuff out so you can focus on what's going on in your GIT, right? Yeah. Which what? Never listen. But you know what? I don't know about y'all, but when I got in the pool, I wasn't swimming laps. Most of the time I was eating in the pool anyways, so. But yeah. <laughs> Just saying, there was no real, I'm the kid that sit on the side. There's nothing, uh, I can eat, I can eat and swim. Look, see, I'm eating and swimming. But I never really moved in a pool anyways. I still don't move in a pool. I get in the pool and I'm like, I just want to sleep on the side. <laughs> so I'm one of the people that's always using this parasympathetic system everywhere. I'm like, yeah, there's no, there's no danger. It's fine. Leave me alone. Let me rest. Anyway, so these are the two main divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Um, an important point to understand is, yes, they do do the opposite of each other. And no, at any given point in time, there is not one that's working and one that's turned off. Both divisions are always at work. And we know why, right? Because our entire being is all about homeostasis. And so these two are always working together to keep everything in homeostasis, right? Um, and so it's not like the sympathetic turns on, so parasympathetic turns off. 
or parasympathetic is kicked in, so sympathetic turns off. No, they are always both working together, okay? And we call that autonomic tone, the idea that you always have something going on with your autonomic system to keep you at a stable homeostatic um, spot, right? Kind of like your muscle tone, you know, how um, your muscles will have some firmness to them even though you're not fully contracting a muscle. And it's because you have some fibers that alternate constantly contracting and relaxing. That's what gives you muscle tone. Same idea with the autonomic nervous system. It is constantly working, either or, or both of them together, maybe one more than the other. But the idea is that one can be more predominant when needed, okay? All right, so this is probably the first time where I'm actually gonna take the time to go through these charts because there is important information in here. Okay, so this is not where we're gonna skip over the charts and, and ignore them. We're actually gonna read through them. There's some important stuff. Over here, you have the somatic nervous system. Over here is your autonomic nervous system, and we are just going to compare the two. The right side should all, or I guess it's left side, should all be stuff we know, and then the right side is the stuff that we're learning new. So in the somatic nervous system, you get your senses from your special senses, things like temperature, 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 touch, and pain, or temperature and pain, all those are your somatic senses, and then your hearing, your vision, and all that is your special sense. For the autonomic nervous system, our sensory receptors are called interoceptors. They are embedded within um, our organs. They are in our blood vessels. They're all over our body, and they are internal, measuring internal environment, right? Okay, um, and they'll also get some feedback from your special senses. Your somatic nervous system is voluntary. It is controlled by your cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is our conscious mind, all right? Okay. <laughs> I'm checking with psychology here. It's our conscious mind. It's the one that uh, helps us make decisions of whether I want to pick this pencil up or I don't. Do I want to pick the drink up or not? Do I want to move to the other side of the room? You have control of what your skeletal muscles do for the most part. Your autonomic nervous system is mainly involuntary, meaning you can't purposely make your stomach empty, right? You can't purposely um, make your uh, blood vessels dilate and perfuse your muscles. But here's the cool part. So it is involuntary, and it is based on the feedback from those receptors. There are people um, who with training have learned to control somewhat their autonomic nervous system. Think about it this way. People who meditate or um, do yoga, who practice yoga, if you, you can train your cortex to control your autonomic nervous system to some extent in that you can do things like uh, decrease your heart rate, lower your blood pressure, um, slow down your breathing. Those are all autonomic system functions that you can control simply with your mind if you train it to do so, right? This is how you get those really calm people. But, but if we all meditated a little bit, it would probably be really good for us. But yeah, for real. So it is um, involuntary, and in here it says limited control. That's what they're talking about when they say limited control. You can control it. The limbic system, yes, is your emotions. Right, but you can with training, you can. You can control your emotions and you can control your body's response to your emotions. But, and, and the opposite is true too. You can get, make yourself really, really sick with your mind. And I see it all the time. I mean, it's a disease. You can, make, you can be perfectly healthy and mentally make yourself physically ill just by using your mind. But the opposite is true, too. You can be not so well and make yourself, make yourself better by using your mind. So we have a lot more control than we realize over our, our health and our well-being with our mind. We just don't all do it. So it's super cool. Okay, 
Um, oh, the motor pathway, you got one neuron when you're talking somatic, and you usually have two neurons when you're talking autonomic, with the exception of that one that goes to the adrenal medulla instead. That's a one neuron pathway. Okay? Oh, I have to get my clicker. See, this is how asleep I am. I am now controlling my mind, telling it that my body is absolutely awake and alert and nothing hurts. My arms are so sore, I can barely lift this thing right now. And why is it that you get more sore the second day after working out than you do the day after? I don't know. I woke up today, I was like, oh, what did I do? I didn't do anything yesterday and I can't move my arm. Do what? Nah, it's lactic acid, girl. Lactic acid. Definitely lactic acid. No. I take Coke and I. You guys want to hear a Coke story? Okay, a real recording thing. After we're done recording, remind me to tell you about snorting Adderall. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> When it gets really boring, we'll talk about that. Okay, let's finish this and then I'll tell you about snorting Adderall. Okay, so neurotransmitters in the somatic nervous system, all of those neurons will use acetylcholine as your neurotransmitter, just one neurotransmitter. In the uh, autonomic nervous system, remember, the autonomic nervous system has the ability to be an upper or a downer. It can excite or inhibit, so there will be different neurotransmitters. It will use acetylcholine, and also you will see uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Don't worry about when and where, because we will talk about that. We'll actually do the neurotransmitters by themselves. But just for now, understand that acetylcholine was the only one there, whereas here we actually have different neurotransmitters that we're going to see in different instances. Um, your somatic system is controlling your skeletal muscle. Your autonomic system will control your smooth muscle. It's going to control your cardiac muscle, your glands. Your smooth muscle is the muscle that's in all of your internal organs. Your cardiac muscle is your heart. And then your glands, that's going to include things like um, your salivary glands, but also your glands that produce hormones, your endocrine glands, and things like that. Um, oh. Somatic can only cause contraction, whereas the autonomic nervous system, remember, I've got both sides here, so I can contract or relax those smooth muscles. I can increase or decrease anything. My heart rate, my breathing rate, my blood pressure, my uh, perfusion, all of that I can go up or down. Okay. So, um, don't tell me when you want to hear the snorting thing. <laughs> Do what? We got plenty of time, don't worry. Okay, so um, we already talked about this. Our motor pathways, remember there's two neurons. There's a preganglionic uh, neuron, which comes from that, uh, it's actually the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, and our postganglionic neuron, which will have its cell body in that ganglion, in the autonomic ganglia. Yeah, maybe before this. Okay, so I am, um, that's fast for a golf cart on a sidewalk. They should get a ticket. Y'all know I almost ran over the president of the college, like it was last year, and I was backing out in the parking lot. Oops, I was backing out in the parking lot, and, um, and he just came out of nowhere on that little hover thingy. What, Segway? He's on the Segway. He's not on the sidewalk. He was right behind my car, right? Yeah, and I don't know how, like, I backed up, and then I saw a shadow. That's what made me stop. Had I not seen the shadow before he ran right behind me, I would have totally killed him. I was, like, just backing right into him. Yeah. So let's talk about snorting um, Adderall. So I'm going to play... Uh... Yeah, you guys will enjoy this later. <laughs> I don't even know how to do that. Fine. Well, now you made me feel like I had to, like, work out, you know. Okay. So looking at the just the sympathetic division right here. Oh, no. I did not click. You are right. Well, I didn't click the clicker. I didn't click the clicker. I just uh, touched it. Oh, that's, the blue won't work. Oh. 
Let's just stick with women. Okay, only the sympathetic division is what we're talking about here, okay? And we're gonna kind of focus on two things. Where does this division originate? Where does it go? Meaning, where are the ganglia? Okay, so where does it originate? Where are the ganglia that are part of the sympathetic nervous system? The sympathetic division actually originates from your spinal roots between T1 and L3. That is your thorax and your lumbar region. That is why you will see the sympathetic division referred to as the thoracolumbar division. You may see it referred to as thoracolumbar outflow. Outflow means the motor neurons that are leaving the spinal cord and innervating your organs, okay? So it comes from the thorax and the lumbar spinal cord. Let's look at the ganglia. We're gonna learn in, an, in the next few slides that there are two locations for the ganglia for the sympathetic division. The first one is going to be right alongside either side of that spinal cord. It looks like this right here, sort of like a chain of um, beads or pearls that goes around on both sides. That is what we call the sympathetic chain or sympathetic trunk, okay? It is simply a chain of sympathetic ganglia all lined up with each other. You will also have a few ganglia out here called the prevertebral ganglia. They are also very close to the spinal cord. So that means that as these motor neurons are leaving the spinal cord, they will leave and find that the ganglia is right next to the spinal cord, okay? So that means that the distance between the spinal cord and your sympathetic ganglia is very short. That also means that the neuron, your preganglionic neuron, will be short when you are talking about the sympathetic nervous system. So I will have short preganglionic axons. But then that second neuron, your postganglionic neuron, has to make it all the way to the organ that it's innervating. And most of our organs are not lying right next to that spinal cord. That's where you get some distance, right? So your postganglionic axons will be long. Okay, so what are we taking from this slide? We know that the sympathetic division originates from the thorax and lumbar areas of the spinal cord, that is thoracolumbar. We know that there are going to be ganglia that are just beside that spinal cord. So my preganglionic axon will be short, my postganglionic axon will be long because that's the one that has to go to the organ. Cool? Yes. All right. Your parasympathetic division, opposite, exact opposite. Your parasympathetic division is going to come from two spots also, but they're going to be way up high in the head, in the cranium, or way down below in the sacral area. So we call the parasympathetic division the craniosacral outflow. Cranio or craniosacral division. Okay? Now, when we're talking about the parasympathetic division, it's going to leave the cranium to one of four um, cranial nerves. Number three was your oculomotor, right? Number seven was your facial. Number nine was what? Glossopharyngeal. And 10 was your vagus. It's going to leave in those cranial nerves, go to the parasympathetic ganglia. All of the parasympathetic ganglia will be called terminal ganglia. What does that mean? Or most of them, terminal. It means that in the parasympathetic system, the ganglia are not right next to that spinal cord. They're actually really close to the organ or embedded inside of the organ, okay? So let me get a different color here and trace my pre and post. Look at this. This, um, I'm just gonna follow the vagus nerve here. Coming off of the, oops, coming, oh, come on now. Coming off of the vagus right here from the cranium. And look, look, this is all pre-ganglionic, 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 pre-ganglionic till right there. The ganglion for this is in the intestine. 
okay? Ganglions are embedded in our organs, in the walls of our organs. So that's where the ganglion is. That means that the postganglionic, I'll do it in a different color. Let's do it in uh, purple. The postganglionic neuron is just this little part right there. Get it? Make sense? Okay, so in the parasympathetic system, you have long preganglionic axons, short postganglionic axons. Most of the ganglia will be terminal ganglia, meaning they are right next to the organ or embedded inside of the organ that they're innervating. Okay? Well, I, well, I want to go back to this just for one second because there's something really cool right here. Do you guys remember the vagus nerve? I mean, we'll talk about it later, but notice how much stuff the vagus nerve is covering. Look at this. Do y'all see that? Yeah. The vagus nerve actually carries 80% of our parasympathetic outflow. That's huge. That's why it's so cool, though, when I'm telling you you can stimulate the vagus and cause a person to pass out. Because one nerve that you stimulate is going to control everything from their heart to their lungs, their liver, their stomach. I mean, you can totally mess a person up with the vagus nerve. <laughs> Lots of ideas here. <laughs> if you wanted to, but you don't have to. Okay. So the ganglia in your sympathetic, sympathetic trunk, that was that long bead that we saw on either side of the spinal cord. Y'all remember that? Yep. Okay. Or the prevertebral ganglia. Those were the ones that you saw up top that were just kind of coming right off of those nerves. Either way, they're both very close to the spinal um, cord. And then we have the parasympathetic where your terminal ganglia, either inside of the organ or right next to it. Okay. Ooh. Wow, we're doing great. Even with all the side talk and everything, we're actually a little ahead. We may need to slow down a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Yes, they do. No, they only say bad. And then that's just a picture. I have worn these shoes all, like, I think since the beginning, like since August, since the beginning of this, like, academic year or last semester, and I keep waiting for someone to call me out on, I'm not a student, but I keep waiting for, um, you know, administration to be, like, um, inappropriate. No one said anything. <laughs> Don't complain, y'all. They're my lab shoes. But yes, um, they can't see it, but. That's, that's why you have to come to class to see my shoes. So yes, they do. They, they say bad on one, and then they have a picture of a donkey on the other. I love these shoes so much. Anyways, <laughs> little insights to my uh, brain that I'm losing. All right, let's talk about sympathetic. Please note we are only talking sympathetic right here, okay? Sympathetic. I couldn't write it any bigger because there was no space on this slide crammed in way too much. Okay. What happens with this preganglionic neuron when it leaves the spinal cord and goes to an autonomic or a sympathetic ganglia? Where does it synapse with that postganglionic neuron? And the reason we have it all written out is because there are four different options of what could happen. Okay. Number one, I'm just going to do them in different colors so you can see. Number one, I can have a, um, I can have, let's see, let's just do this one. I can have it come in, have this come in. My, my preganglionic neuron goes into a ganglia and then synapses immediately on the postganglionic. Okay? Easy peasy. Preganglionic pre neuron went to the ganglia, synapsed with a postganglionic neuron at the ganglia. Straightforward. Okay. Number two. Number two. I can have it, I can have this motor neuron come in to the ganglia, but instead of synapsing, it can go up or down and then synapse in a different ganglia on a postganglionic neuron. Okay, yes. So now we are using the sympathetic trunk like an elevator. Come into the ganglia, go up, go down, and then find your postganglionic neuron. 
Number three. Oh, let me do a different color, sorry. Uh, purple. Number three. My preganglionic neuron can come in, not synapse in that ganglia, travel up or down out of the sympathetic trunk, and instead synapse in one of those other ganglia, the prevertebral ganglia, with a post ganglionic neuron. Are we good so far? So my first option, my preganglionic neuron leaves the spinal cord, goes to the first sympathetic ganglion, it, it, the closest one to it, synapses with a postganglionic neuron. My second option, my preganglionic neuron goes to that sympathetic ganglia that's closest to it, goes up or down, and then synapses at a different level with my postganglionic neuron. Option number three, my preganglionic neuron goes to the closest sympathetic ganglia, which is the sympathetic trunk, travels up or down, leaves the sympathetic trunk, goes to a prevertebral ganglia, one of those ganglia that are outside of this chain or bead of pearls, and then synapses there with a postsynaptic uh, neuron. Cool? Option number four. Oh, different coloring, man. I'm running out of colors. Option number four. My preganglionic neuron leaves the spinal cord, goes into the sympathetic trunk, travels down, passes through that prevertebral, does not synapse, goes to the adrenal medulla and synapses on a chromaffin cell. So number four involves one motor neuron, only your preganglionic neuron. And then it bypasses all of the other places as it passes through those ganglia and goes right to the adrenal gland. Does this make sense? Yes. Remember, that's where in the adrenal medulla, it's going to synapse on a chromaffin cell. The chromaffin cells are the ones that will release neurotransmitter, that will be released into the bloodstream and that will cause the effect. Do I need to spend time on this one? No? Erica, my measurement? Okay. See, I don't, you get, you get it all the time. <laughs> she said you don't get it. That means somebody else might not get it. All right. Whew. And here is that same picture with no words. And I only put the picture in there because I felt you may want to print the picture on its own. Um, because it was a little bit crowded on the slide before that, okay? That's the only reason. And of course, I make these PowerPoints on my laptop, which I don't know why I went for the smallest laptop possible, because I didn't want to carry a heavy laptop. My first, my, the laptop that I was replacing was like a 17-inch screen, and so I'm like, I'm so tired of this heavy laptop, and I went and got a little, like, 12-inch screen, and I'm dying, I'm going blind. And so <laughs> I'm trying to do these PowerPoints, and I'm already losing my vision. And so, um, trying the best I can. Like, I'm pretty sure you guys can't read these words, can you? Can you? Okay, good. You can't, you need to sit up front, girl. We can do this. Oh, ooh. Um, I have to get out of it to do that, don't I? I have to do something else. Double click on what? No, it's, it's in writing mode. Oh, if I do that. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. Why did I think I could do it? Why was I even trying? It's fine. Y'all can do this at home and like blow it up really big like I do. <laughs> It's fine. You don't even have to look at the words as long as you understand it. That's the whole point of the picture. Okay. Now, in addition to those pathways that we talked about with the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, there are plexuses within the sympathetic system. What is a plexus? Right. It's a network, a network of neurons that will communicate or work together to cover a certain area. 
notice that your autonomic plexuses will actually contain both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, it's going to cover both of them. Now, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these plexuses because it's not that big of a deal. They are pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can pretty much guess because these plexuses, bless their hearts, actually were named after either the organ they innervate or the, you know, the artery they're next to or the area they're next to. So their names really tell you what they do and makes it super easy. The celiac plexus, y'all remember the celiac trunk? That was a huge first artery, remember, off of the aorta? So the celiac plexus really kind of innervates all of the um, organs that got their blood supply from there. Things like the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, those are all with the celiac plexus. It is the largest plexus for the autonomic nervous system, okay? So I would maybe add that here somewhere that it is the largest one, okay? Superior mesenteric plexus. Where did we see the superior mesenteric artery? That was your second branch. Where did it go? It went to the small intestine. So the superior mesenteric plexus will innervate the small intestine. Inferior mesenteric plexus, what did that innervate? What did the inferior mesenteric artery innervate? It went right to the colon, right? The large intestine. Did y'all block out AMP1? It really is. You do need it. I promise you need it. Okay. Inferior mesenteric artery went right to the colon, and that is what is covered with your inferior mesenteric plexus. It's the colon. Your renal plexus, kidneys, cardiac, heart, pulmonary, lungs, hypogastric. Not a trick. So do you remember the areas that you did in the very first week of AMP1 and you talked about your, um, your gastric area was around the belly button, your epigastric was above the belly button, your hypogastric was below the belly button. So this is me with my hand on my hypogastric area. What am I covering? My bladder, my uterus, all that good stuff, the pelvis. So that's what the hypogastric area is going to, or hypogastric plexus, it's going to be your bladder. Yeah, bladder and pelvic organs. Lungs. Make sense? Yeah. And this is a picture of what a plexus looks like. There are several plexi, those were not all of them. These are some of them that are pictured here for you, but you can see how they kind of make this like mesh work of innervation, mixing that sympathetic and parasympathetic um, motor neurons with each other. Not mixing like braiding them, just traveling next to each other. Cool? Okay, awesome. All right. And that was really like the main bulk of it. Now we're just gonna reiterate everything over and over. So, um, a little more specific here. When we're talking about the sympathetic, sympathetic neurons, your preganglionic <coughs> sympathetic neurons will actually originate from the lateral gray horn of where the thoracic and lumbar, lumbar. So it is called thoracolumbar. So it is thoracolumbar, thoracolumbar. Um, your sympathetic trunk ganglia, that was your little uh, beads, your uh, chains of beads, right? Like that. Those are used, are, I, just, I don't need you to know the numbers at two cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral. No, I want you to understand that there is one on each side, okay? They do come in pairs. All right. The parasympathetic comes from the gray matter of the sacral and also, where's the cranial? Uh, nuclei. Oh, here it is. Nuclei in the brain stem. What are nuclei? We learned that they were masses of gray matter in the brain, right? So from the cranium, the nuclei in the cranium and the sacral uh, lateral horns, that makes it the cranio, uh-oh, feeling good. That makes it the cranio sacral 
division, right? Coming from up here and down there. We learned that the cranial parasympathetic outflow goes through those four cranial nerves, remember? Yes? Yeah, the oculomotor, the facial, okay. <laughs> and the main one was the vagus. And then the sacral parasympathetic outflow comes from those sacral spinal nerves. And then this right here, we talked about the vagus nerve carries 80% of your craniosacral outflow, meaning the vagus nerve carries 80% of your parasympathetic neurons. That's huge, right? Yeah, that is a big deal. And that's why I like the vagus so much because you can get so much control out of that thing. <laughs> and then this is a nice illustration because that other picture was a little too small for you. This is nice and blown up for you to see where those um, or how those parasympathetic ganglia are embedded inside. So notice you have your motor neuron starting up here in that lateral gray horn. It's going to travel through that anterior root of that spinal nerve. Because remember, we already know that this posterior root was sensory and the anterior root was all motor, right? We learned that last time. It's going to travel through the spinal nerve and then go down into the effector organ and this is where that ganglia is. That's where that synapse is. So you have a really long presynaptic or preganglionic neuron, and you have a very short postganglionic neuron. Yes, yes, yeah, that is. And that's what it looks like in the parasympathetic system, which is why we don't have a parasympathetic chain or um, any prevertebral parasympathetic ganglia. Most of them are embedded in the organ or inside of the wall of a vessel or somewhere away from the spinal cord. Okay, where are we on time? You guys are always ahead of everybody. How does this happen? I don't talk enough to you guys. I don't tell you enough stories. I know, we, you wanna talk about snorting something else? <laughs> I don't want you guys, I mean, this is where I stopped with everybody if we got to here. I don't want to. I don't want to make you guys go further. Fine, we'll do it if we want to. Might as well, right? Do I have any questions? Did I go too fast on anything? Any questions from Zoom? No, really? Are you guys really getting this? Yeah. Yeah, you got to go over it again. Okay. When I'm because I'm talking too fast. All right, we'll move on. Okay. I'm going to introduce you to this. You're going to get confused and you're going to be upset. And then we're going to pause because we're going to do it again next time because it's, it's going to be a little, un, it's going to make you unhappy. Um, but that's, which is why I didn't want to end with it. I'd rather begin with it, but it's okay. So expect to be upset and then you'll be happy next week when you get it. Okay. <laughs> what? I thought I heard something. I'm losing my mind. Okay. Our neurotransmitters. We know that acetylcholine was the one that we saw in the somatic system, and that we're also going to see it in the uh, in the autonomic nervous system, right? In addition to that, I told you we have other neurotransmitters for the autonomic nervous system. For somatic, for somatic, yes. But now we're talking uh, autonomic. So we have acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. We also have norepinephrine as a transmitter. You will see norepinephrine referred to as noradrenaline. Does that sound familiar? Because noradrenaline is sometimes uh, Adrenaline. Have you ever heard of that word? Okay. Yes, same. Okay. So we have acetylcholine and we have norepinephrine. 
we have classified our neurons in the autonomic nervous system as either cholinergic because they release acetylcholine or adrenergic because they release norepinephrine. So the neuron is classified based on which neurotransmitter it is releasing. Are we okay so far? Okay. So if I'm a motor neuron and I'm releasing acetylcholine, I have, I, I am now a cholinergic neuron. If I am a motor neuron and I release noradrenaline, I am a adrenergic neuron. Okay. That was basics because we're going to learn later on that there are different receptors for this, these cholinergic neurons. There are going to be nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors, okay? And we will talk about those next week. Um, we're still good on time? We are still good on time. Okay. Cholinergic neurons, adrenergic neurons. Cholinergic neurons are releasing what? Acetylcholine. Adrenergic neurons are releasing what? What? <laughs> I can't even spell it. Let it go. Let it go. Can't spell it. Okay. So, which neurons are cholinergic? Which neurons are adrenergic? Meaning, which neurons secrete acetylcholine? You ready? First of all, here, every parasympathetic neuron is a cholinergic neuron. That means that the parasympathetic nervous system only uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter, exactly like your somatic division. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, why, are, why do we have opposing thumbs? I don't know, <laughs> just cause that's the way it is. <laughs> Gee, it's getting all complicated. <laughs> Look at this. Just ask questions. <laughs> no, only ask questions I can answer. <laughs> Did you have coffee this morning? I did. I didn't have my medication. Yes. Why? I, I can't even think about why. I don't know. I don't know. It just is. Just because. <laughs> just because. That, that's, that's the flavor they like. Okay. Parasympathetic neurons only like acetylcholine. That's how it is. Okay. <laughs> Cholinergic neurons in the sympathetic division, all preganglionic sympathetic neurons. Preganglionic sympathetic neurons will secrete acetylcholine. What about your postganglionic neurons for the sympathetic division? Your postganglionic neurons for the sympathetic division will secrete noradrenaline. They are adrenergic neurons. There is one exception. Yes. The exception is your sweat glands. Why? Because they are cholinergic. So your postganglionic only to the sweat glands is what secretes acetylcholine. I'm going to pause here because this is a very simple concept, but it's one of the most confusing or hardest to remember. So we're going to take our time on this one. So all parasympathetic neurons, pre and post ganglionic, secrete what? Acetylcholine. So they are called cholinergic. What about your sympathetic pre ganglionic neurons? What are they? Cholinergic. Okay, so from the beginning, everybody's the same. 
your pregang all of your preganglionic neurons, all preganglionic autonomic neurons secrete acetylcholine. Okay. Your postganglionic neurons, parasympathetic postganglionic neurons are secreting acetylcholine. Postganglionic sympathetic neurons are secreting norepinephrine. They are adrenergic. And then you can add your exception of the sweat glands. Sweat glands didn't want to join all the other sympathetic postganglionic neurons. They decided to go back up and be cholinergic instead. Are you really asking that now? <laughs> we will go over that. We'll go over that. Just wait because we still have to add receptors to this. So we're just trying to get the basic now. Don't be complicating it just yet. Hold on to that. And I think I'll even be able to answer your question when we go to, or when I've had medicine, um, <laughs> when I'm medicated. I just want the basics right now. Okay, this is just a basic concept here we're trying to get because we still have to add like specific receptors and it's going to um, get a little more complicated. So do we get this part so far? Okay, so if we are talking about preganglionic, preganglionic, sympathetic, and parasympathetic neurons, they are cholinergic. Postganglionic, parasympathetic neurons are cholinergic. Postganglionic, oh, did I say parasympathetic already? No. Yes. Postganglionic sympathetic neurons are adrenergic, adrenergic, except for the ones that go to sweat glands, and only certain sweat glands. Yeah. See how I keep adding more to it? Only certain sweat glands. <laughs> okay, and those, the ones that go to sweat glands are with everybody else, they're cholinergic. Okay, so if you have trouble remembering this, go ahead and put it in your head that every autonomic um, neuron is going to be cholinergic except, except for your postganglionic sympathetic. Can you remember that? And make it easier. So everything is cholinergic except for your postganglionic sympathetic. And then you're never going to forget that the sweat glands went with everybody else. Yeah. Cool? All right. I'm not going to go into this part here because I want to revisit that last slide one more time when we start again next week. We're going to stop here.